Turn your Bibles over to Acts 10. Acts 10. <clears throat> Turn your Bibles over to Acts 10. And the title of my sermon this afternoon, or this evening, is God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. And the verse that I'm focusing it on, but we are going to go a little bit through Acts 10, and then we're going to close out on a different set of scripture. So keep your finger there. But in Acts 10, 33, it says, uh, Immediately... There, therefore, I sent thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto his children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. And so we're here in, in the book of Acts, and you know it's a real uh, famous story where Peter uh, has a vision, and also this, this individual from Caesarea called Cornelius, his name's Cornelius, he has a vision, and it's where Peter is sent out to the Gentiles in a Jewish nation, and he sends out specifically to an Italian band, right? I mean, it says here in the beginning, if you go there to Acts 10.1, and so what I'm going to be preaching about today, and I mean, there's so many ways to, to really go about this. There is uh, scripture where God is respectful unto either, in, in like in Acts, I mean, in Genesis 4, it gives us that he did had respect unto uh, Abel's offering, and then he had respect unto Israel. But that's another sermon, but I did just want to touch it lightly that when God does respect certain things, it's the obedience, but God is not a respecter of persons. And that's a really important thing when we're coming into a, uh, growing into our Christian life because one of the things that we tend to do as humans is we want to be pleasers of men. You know, you've heard people say, oh, I, my personality type is I'm a people pe pleaser. And the reality is my personality type really is that, you know, I've grown up, I'm, I try to be a people pleaser. One of the things that I, I tend to do, especially after a, a sermon that I've tried to get away from is, you know, once I preach the sermon, I try not to think about what I preached for a little bit. Because I, I tend to second guess a lot of what I say. It's, it has nothing to do with whether I studied the message or whether I know that I'm preaching the thing correctly or I, I put my best, uh, my best foot forward. But what I do tend to do is, you know, what, what would someone else think? Or it, it doesn't really matter what they think. I mean, God's word has got word. You know, if, if they don't like the preaching that I did from the pulpit today or if you guys don't like what I'm going to preach, well, then you take it up with God. You know, it's, it's our duty to preach God's word. But you're there in Acts 10.1. Keep your finger there uh, for the first point because we're going to be in the Acts and then we're going to, I just have three points for you tonight. And in Acts 10, 1, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called it, the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And then if we skip down there in verse 4, it says, And when he looked upon him, so he has a vision. Well, let's just read verse 3 for the sake of context. We're not going to go through it all. But he says, in verse 3, he says, He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a mention, uh, for a memorial before God. And just something that really stood out there, and before I even touch on the points is, you know, God hears our prayers god pays attention to our heart you know he paid attention to this uh man here cornelius and it says it's a it's a memorial unto god it's a good thing and so he heard the prayers and what we can glean from this at least on the surface is that part of his prayer was that someone would come and show them the word of god and we're going to see this in context in the book of acts but the first point that i have today is god is no respecter of persons therefore he didn't respect our feelings. And what I mean by that is, you know, too many times, especially in today's age, people want to just do what feels right. They want, to, they want to tell you to follow your heart or things. But if we look at God's word, God just does things based on what God needs to do. You know, and the men of God, in spite of whatever they're feeling, if they're really truly men of God, they're going to follow God because it's his word. In spite of, the, of, of what people will say or think, and we're going to actually see Peter go through this, and that's why that this first point uh, is focused here in the book of Acts. If you're there in verse 17, it says, uh, uh, Acts 10, 17, 
Well, let's uh, you know what? Let's just set this up on verse nine. I just want to, I want to cover this. If if I don't get to the other points, this is important. It says in verse nine, it says, "On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth." Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon. uncommon. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again in heaven and then we see there in verse 17 it says now while peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean behold the men which were sent from cornelius had made inquiry for simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether simon which was surnamed peter were lodged there while peter thought on the vision the spirit said unto him behold three men seek thee arise therefore and get thee thou get thee down and go with them Doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So we see here that, I mean, Peter immediately, uh, he has a vision of what's going to transpire. I mean, Cornelius gets the vision to, to go get Peter. And Peter has a vision of who's coming and what he's supposed to do. And just on a side note, this is one of the verses or one of the, the, the set of scriptures that really did it for me when I was a former Seventh-day Adventist because of, God's very clear here. He presents food that's unclean in Peter's eyes. And God says, you know, what I call, what I have cleansed, let no man call it common or unclean. You know, and a lot of people will argue that obviously that was a vision and it was metaphorical for him to go out into the Gentiles and not just the Jews. And although that is a truth here, also, I mean, God could have used any metaphor, but he used the meats because he had gotten rid of all that. You know, this is coming from the Old Testament, but that's a whole other side point. I don't want to get uh, sidetracked, but one thing that we see here in verse 17, it says, after this vision, it says in verse 17, now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men were sent from, from, from Cornelius. And so we see here that Peter is having feelings. You know, we have feelings of doubt. We have feelings of sadness or depression or grief or excitement or joy or happiness relation peter is actually doubting the vision that he just experienced i don't know if it's because it was just a great thing or you know have you ever had a dream and then you wake up and you don't know if the dream was real or not and it takes you a long time maybe like a couple of days to figure out and then you finally come to a conclusion you have an aha moment you're like no that was a dream because you remember certain things that couldn't have happened in real life maybe that's what's going on here i mean we don't know what what all Peter's thinking, but what we do know is that he's doubting the vision. But what I love here is that as Cornelius's men show up, what has happened is verse 19 says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And so, I mean, regardless of what Peter was feeling, because we know he's going to go, we're going to read further on, he goes. You know, and too many times, why is it that we have feelings? Because really what we're thinking is, what are other people going to think about us? I mean, if we really got to the crux of what Peter is thinking here, he's probably thinking, you know, if I tell somebody this, you know, are they really going to believe that this transpired? And, and what's interesting is Peter, I mean, Peter was there with, with Jesus. I mean, he witnessed the miracle. He saw the things. So how much more doubt are we going to experience in our life sometimes when we're dealing with things? But what, what's interesting is what did Peter do? I mean, if the word of God says to do something, we have to remove aside all feelings, all respect for people, all respect for things, and respect God's word. You know, I think the, one of the ultimate things that starts to happen as you grow in your Christian life is that you have to focus on the fact that we're here to worship God. And we're here to do God's will, and God's will will be our will. You know, that we want to be in God's will, is what I, and let me make sure that's clear. Our will should be God's will. It's not the other way around. It's not like, well, I feel like doing this, so God should figure out how to feel like I'm feeling. No, it's really 
We just need to do God's will in spite of what we're feeling. And what ends up happening, and I really believe that Peter's able to obey quickly, is because what happens over your growth in, in Christianity, your Christian life as you're growing spiritually, is that you, you learn to fight the feelings. You know, my wife will attest to this, that when we first got married, you know, I'm just, I come from a Hispanic background. I come from a Hispanic home. Um, I don't know if that's all Hispanics, but at least the Hispanics I grew up around in, not just my family, but the people that surround me, you know, they're, they come from a, a, a culture of high paranoia, high fear, high anxiety. There's a lot of drama in a Hispanic home, you know, and everything's like, you know, exaggerated and, and overdone. I mean, so much so that this weekend when uh, we went with uh, Steadfast Soul Winning into Reynosa, I didn't tell my parents. I don't mind saying it here because my parents don't listen to my Span and my English sermons. They listen to my Spanish sermons. If my dad and my mom found out that I went to Reynosa, Mexico, so I mean, they'd probably have a heart attack. And you, you guys might be laughing. I saw, I saw a couple of you. They literally would probably have a heart attack if they knew that I went into Mexico. They, I mean, there's a high tension of fear in a Hispanic home. That, and so think about that. You know, if I would tell them, I know how this conversation would go. Mom, dad, I'm going to go so in in Mexico. <gasps> I know. You, no, no, you can't go. And my dad would be like, I'm still your dad. You can't, you know, I, this is the kind of conversation we have. Then I'd be like, well, I'm going anyways. <laughs> so then I'd go and then I'd come back and my dad would probably be sick. My mom would be like, see what you did to your dad. This is the reason why he's probably going to die. It's your fault. You know, there'd be all, I know it's funny, but it's true. It's really, it's really sick. So then the worst part is then they start to, you know, they're my parents. I've, I've, I grew up with them, so then they plant the idea in my mind. So I'd be like, well, maybe should I go? And the Bible does say obey your parents. You know, the Bible does say honor thy father and thy mother. Should I? And then we'd start having all kinds of feelings, and then make, the next thing you know, I'd probably talk myself out of it. But look, the reality is, the, what I did do is, I mean, I'm not going to be dumb about it. We did go into a dangerous area. I called my wife, and I said, hon, I love you. I glad, I'm glad that she got saved when she was three. She didn't live in fear like, I, like I've grown up, right? I said, honey, I love you. I'm going soul winning. If anything happens to me, you just tell our children why daddy died, and you move on with life. I said, I doubt anything's going to happen. I just don't see how God would do. You know, it's going to happen, but it, it, it's just not that, that dangerous, right? And I'm not going to let danger stop me from doing God's commandment of going out into all the world and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Peter here is doubting. But he said, go, and what did he do? He went. Now you say, well, you sound a little exaggerated. Maybe. I mean, but there are shootings in Mexico. Reynosa has shootings every day. I know that for a fact. But that's, that, that should never stop us from doing the thing. You know, there's going to come a time. Just today, it was interesting. Uh, I was updating one of the videos for our YouTube channel, and they said that I had to update if our videos were, were okay for children. And I didn't look it all up, so I'm not going to touch into it, but it said something about something called COPPA, C-O-P-P, -P, and it's a federal law that says you need to protect, you know, the, what children watch, which, you know, it's an oxymoron because there's a lot of stuff that children have access to. But, and then you click and you say, yeah, my stuff is available to children. And then when you finally have the setting, it says you're, I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but it says, like, you have said that your videos are okay for children to watch, and then it says you decided this, like it's put it on you because it's a, it's a law. And if you put something on there, I, I guess they could fine you or even worse and stuff like that. Eventually, you know what that, what that is? It's a, guise to sen it's a guise to censor the word of God. Because who runs this country? Do Christians run this country? No. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna tell you that what you're preaching from the word of God is not right for children. And then we have to make a decision whether we're going to respect men or we're going to respect God. And the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. Right? Go down to verse 22. It says, and they said, now we see here that Peter gets in and said, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one that feareth God and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear the words of thee. And so we see that God heard the prayers and he sends a man specifically to this nation and he says, Peter, I've chosen you. Which is interesting because you know, if you know anything about Peter, I mean, Paul rebuked Peter 
Paul got on to Peter for preaching the circumcision. You know, and he's sending them into the Jewish nation, he says, into the, into the nation of the Jews, but he's not sending them to the Jews, he's sending them to the Gentiles. We know this, right? And then verse 25 says, And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met with him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now what's interesting is it's great to have him send someone like Peter who basically spent his whole ministry being humbled by Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, he's the one that's like, Peter, don't, God, don't wash, Jesus, don't wash my feet. Wash my entire body. You know what? You're not dying. I'm dying. I mean, constantly just putting his foot in his mouth. Constantly just getting it. But he's one of the greats, one of the great apostles of the New Testament, right? I mean, we know so much so that he was hung upside down. He didn't even want to get uh, murdered or killed the way that Jesus Christ was killed. So he's, get, he's, get, yeah, he's sent there. And I, um, the reason I say that's interesting is because this guy sees Peter, so he knows of Peter, and he falls at his feet and worships him. And Peter reminds him really quick, hey, there's no need for that. Now, if Peter was a respecter of people... I mean, that's, that's cool. It's kind of like these idiots now. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but Kanye's coming to Houston, you know? This weekend, he's going to be with, uh, with uh, Joel Falstein. You know, they're going to be hanging out together. And guess what? They love the adoration of men. They love the respect of men. And I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't like that. Even Peter didn't like it. It says, but Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that, that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful. It is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So Peter is breaking the law to do what God has commanded him to do. I mean, maybe that's why Peter was doubting. Maybe he understood the vision better than, than, we, than it's given here. I don't know. I mean, it, didn't give it, it just says he doubted, but then he was sent doubting nothing, and he obeyed the commandment of God. You know, how do you overcome your anxiety and your depression and all the things that you're feeling? Get in the Word of God and obey it. And I mean, honestly, if you just start doing it, you will get over it. I mean, this is something I fight with probably on a very hourly basis i mean it's just it's just part of like i said i mean now i'm getting rid of that old man and i've been saved now for almost you know 15 years so it gets easier every day but it's something that you you the flesh is always at war with the spirit and some people that I mean maybe that's why this stands out to me more because one of the things that i focus on doing is not caring what people think but the flesh man the flesh really wants to know what people think Right? I mean, in God, he has no respect for our feelings. Go to uh, verse 42, and then we'll close out this point. Go to verse 42. He says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is he which was ordained of God to be, to be the judge of quick and dead, uh, and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look, this saying is not my saying, but it's a great saying, is that Jesus is not the Jesus of race. You're saved by not the race, but by grace. Too many times today, people just get, you know, they want to point the finger and say that for whatever reason in here, look, it says those are of the circumcision. Well, who, are the, who are of the circumcision? The Jews. The Jews are looking, and it says they were astonished, which shouldn't be astonishing that God can do miracles, but apparently they're, they're astonished. They believed, and immediately instead of being gr grateful that they believed, now they're astonished that the Gentiles also believed and the Holy Ghost is on them you know because that's what Peter's doing right and what did Peter do he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ think about it Peter didn't break the law for just any reason Peter broke the law to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ he said look I shouldn't keep company with you but now that I'm here let me tell you why and he went ahead and preached the 
He says, if you believe, it says that, uh, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. I mean, that's it. He gave him the gospel. Now, you don't have to turn there. Go to Romans uh, 3. You turn to Romans. I'm just going to read for you real quick. We see here in Psalm 40, verse 1, the Bible says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up, uh, up also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. We're, we know that this is a picture of Jesus being pulled out of hell, right? And it, uh, of us being put on that rock and establish my goings and he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear it and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Look, I didn't want to bring it up, but it's, I did see that just before I came here. Kanye's going to be in town, and people have respect to what? The proud. And what did the Bible say? It says, blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. Well, you can't trust on the Lord unless you believe on the Lord. I'm putting all my faith and trust in you. That's part of the sinner's prayer that we, we pray with people. Not by my works, but by my faith in you, right? It says, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Look, we shouldn't have any respect for those that lie, for those that deceive, for those that are looking to send you where? I mean, the first part says, a horrible pit out of the miry clay. That's a picture of hell. Look, if you don't trust on the truth, then you're deceiving with the lie. And the lie only leads to one place, the destruction in hell. And I'm talking about, obviously, the eternal lie. There's a lot of lies, but I'm talking here, I'm behind the pulpit, I'm telling you about this thing of eternity. It's either in hell forever or in heaven. And the challenge is that a lot of people get up behind a pulpit or they go out door knocking, but they're respecters of people. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses door knock not because they care for your soul. It's because they're trying to get that respect of the guy who's counting their hours. You know, they submit their hours like, like some cool thing so they can get a badge or, or some kind of fake reward. The Mormons do it for the same reason. We do it because we just want people to not go to hell. As a matter of fact, most of the time, we just go out. Most people don't know how often we go out or what we do. I mean, we do talk about some success. I'm not against it. But I would venture to say that out of the success that you hear or the things that we talk about so many, that's a small percentage of the actual work that's being done when we're out there doing it. And the, the preparation that goes into it and the things like that. Because honestly, if you're doing it for the respect of persons, you probably shouldn't do it. Probably shouldn't waste your time because this is for the Lord. You know, the reason we're not respecters of persons is because we, we respect, we fear the Lord. You know, the minute we stop fearing the Lord is the minute we start respecting other people. And that's what really gets us in trouble. The second point is that God is no respecter of persons. Therefore, he doesn't owe us an explanation. You know, because we're getting to the day and age where there's an attack on the word of God. You know, people are like, oh, you're one of those guys that just reads the King James. Well, there's other versions. Not according to not according to the Word of God. Not according to my faith. You say, well, how do you know? Well, look, I've done the research. But even if we didn't do the research, I know because the Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right? This is the word that was given to the English-speaking people for a long time. You know, if God wanted to change things, he would have done it. And let me tell you something. God's not the author of, uh, author of confusion. He would not, logically, just, he's not going to, it would never make sense that God would say, well, look, I gave you the King James, because you're English-speaking people, but now, hundreds of years later, I'm going to give you hundreds of versions so that you don't know up from down, so that when we're out soul winning, with this lady in Mexico, and you're getting to the gospel, she says, well, I don't know what the truth is anymore, because I've been to a Catholic church, and the Catholic Bible says one thing, and I've been to a Jehovah's Witnesses church, and the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible says something, and I've been to an Adventist church, and that says something else, and so what you're telling me, how do I know it's the truth? And then, I can't get her to the point where she understands that she needs faith in Jesus Christ, and she walks away, guess what, still damned to hell. 
And my heart goes out because I don't even know if she did it because she hates God. I don't even know if she did it because she understands that she's rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. She did it because there's deception in the world because people respect people instead of the word of God. You know, if, if, if Baptists would have just stood up ages ago, hundreds of years ago, and said, this is the word of God, and then stood on it firm, there'd be no debate. But the challenge is we get all these scholars and, and learned people and PhDs, and they're like, well, in the whatever, in the Greek, and in the Hebrew, and in the whatever. Look, it takes a long time to learn a language. I say that I'm fluent in Spanish and English. I don't know that I've mastered either one. I mean, it, you have to know, you have to have a good mastery. People who wrote the King James, those 54 scholars, they mastered a lot of languages. It was a different time. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was no television programming. You could spend hours and hours reading and memorizing and learning things. You know, people say we're smarter today. I actually would make the argument that it takes a lot more discipline to try to actually learn something today. There's more distractions. Even in your generation, some of you grew up, there was no TV when you were born. You know, the TV came around, what, in the 50s, 60s? You had more time to do what? Learn. You would actually read at night. You'd get eight hours of sleep. You'd, do, you'd play outside. You'd learn how to use a hammer and a nail. Men would be men and women would be women. There would be no confusion. But now, it's the opposite. Why? Because people are respecting man instead of the word of God. Go over to, you're in Romans 3, but in a, uh, I'm just going to read for you two verses, one Ecclesiastes and one Psalm. But the thing is, he doesn't always an explanation. I'm just giving you two examples here. You know, you always hear, well, why do good things happen? I mean, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, God doesn't owe us an explanation. Number one, even if, if, he, if he was going to give us an explanation, we could just look to the Word of God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.20, says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You know, I hate when people say it, it does. I mean, the Bible specific what we should call good. But I hate when people just blanket other things. And they're like, well, Donald Trump's a good man. The Bible says we're all sinners. And the sin comes short of the glory of God. You know, when God called someone good, it's because they're obedient to his word and they're doing his will. Or let's not go so high. Sometimes just family members, oh, you shouldn't be so rough on so-and-so. He's a good person. I'm not a good person, according to the Bible. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we need to walk in the spirit to be good, but the flesh is always sinful. I mean, the flesh is always going to let you down. In Psalm 14, verse 3, and you're in Romans, we're, we're getting there. Psalm 14, verse 3 says, They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You know, we use the New Testament to go out soul winning, but we're just regurgitating what the Old Testament said. Jesus hasn't changed for all eternity. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Romans 3 verse 1 says, what, advantageth, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? You know, we got a society today that says, oh, I think, therefore God exists. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh fences? I speak as a man. God forbid, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet I also why yet am I am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported. And as if some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come. Whose damnation is just? What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proof, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And I know I could have just quoted Romans 3.10, but there's a context there. 
look, it doesn't matter if you're yellow, red, black and white, if you're Hispanic or white or Jew, we're all under sin. Why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Actually, bad things happen because we're sinners and we're under the law. Look, it's the grace of God that allows us in heaven. It's the blood that's covered us that, that says we're, we're eternal. It's not by my works. It's not by your works. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. And let me tell you, we think foolishly, we think foolishly quite often. Hebrews 1, turn to Hebrews 11, but Hebrews 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by their prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And that's the, that's the verse for my second point, and, or the second sub-point, or whatever you want to call it, this explanation people ask for. These are just two of the ones that popped in my head. So they seem to be popular as, you know, prove to me that God exists. I've had that question asked. Prove to me that God exists. How do we know God exists? Really, God doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. He doesn't. And I think when we get to that level, we have a higher respect and fear and adoration for God. Right? I mean, the onerous is on us to prove that God doesn't exist. I mean, that's an exercise in futility. The Bible tells us, by whom also he made the worlds. If you go to Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Look, if he had respect for the recompense of the reward, that means he didn't respect the person. And we know that's clear because Moses didn't respect Pharaoh. He didn't respect Egypt because he feared the Lord. And I love this verse. I, I, I've used it now a couple of times in my preaching because it just... It's a great, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Look, Moses knew of the blood, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It just, it was a foreshadowing. It's clear because Hebrews cleared it up for us. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Look, what are we supposed to respect? Definitely not people, because people will let you down. I mean, we're going to let each other down. I love my wife, but let me tell you, I let her down all the time. I try not to. I really do. I try not to. You know, I want to be there for her, but every once in a while, I just have that foot and mouth disease. And you know when you're, when you're, when you're more prone to foot and mouth disease? When you're comfortable around people. And I'm real comfortable around my wife, so I have a lot, of, you know, it's, it's, it's actually the opposite effect, right? Or anybody like that. But let's go ahead and just close this out. You know, we, God doesn't owe us an explanation. He doesn't, he doesn't owe us an explanation. These people that, that want to, you know, or, or he, he, that want God to respect our feelings or the way that we should do things. Look, the, the reason that we stick to the old ways, the old paths, is because God tells us in his word to do that. There's a reason why we don't have certain kind of music in this church or we dress a certain way, or we talk a certain way, it's because the Bible commands us to. But if the world says, well, no, we want God to, to understand how we're feeling. You know, the world's changing. It's not the world and the generation you grew up in. Yeah, but nothing changes. As a matter of fact, just the other day, I saw a guy wearing a, a tie, and he had a, pay, uh, a paisley uh, pattern. You know, the, is it paisley? Did I say that correct? The, you know, the pay, whatever, you know, you remember that? It looks like a teardrop and it's got a bunch of colors in it and everything. That's from like the 80s. When I was growing up and I was a young kid, my dad had a bunch of those ties. But if I asked him, he'd think he's really cool because, you know, he got the newest, greatest tie. Well, that stuff's been around forever. Then they went to the skinny ties. Now the big ties are coming back. You know, eventually, the only thing that, that I would hope we, we could get recycled out of that I don't see, foresee in the near future is these skinny pants and these skinny jeans for men. Well, actually, you know, for women too, just, just get rid of it all. Like, it's just very confusing. 
you know, men should look like men and women should look like women. But let's go, well, let's go ahead and close out. God is not a respecter of persons. Therefore, he didn't need anyone. But the Bible says that he's chosen to use us. You know, you're somebody because God has given us that duty. But there's a difference when you understand God doesn't need any of us. But what, what a beautiful thing that he chooses to use us. That he's given us that duty to go spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, you go to Proverbs, and I'm going to close out with these verses. Because the, the purpose of, of this sermon today is that we should be reminded often of how we should act around others. You know, we're going to see this in Proverbs 24. We're going to be in Proverbs. And then if you want to go to James, and we'll be in 1 Peter. Just If you want to turn with me, I'm just going to go pretty quickly. But Proverbs 24, verse 23 says, These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse. Nations shall abhor him. There's a reason why we probably hate so many of the politicians. It's right there in Proverbs. But to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. You know, people say, why do you talk so much about other people or religions or false prophets? The Bible gives us clear instruction that we should rebuke, you know, those that are leading others astray. You know, I didn't rebuke that lady when I was, uh, you know, I, I'm using that example. The one that was confused about all the Bibles and religions, I didn't rebuke her. My heart went out to her because it's not her fault. But I wish that I could get in front of those guys that taught her all that wrong stuff because I'd rebuke them sharply. You know, my mom, that, I, I've stopped. My, I love my parents. And by the way, both of my parents are saved and they support the ministry and all that stuff. But I, again, I said, it's just a cultural thing. I grew up, we grew up differently. So my mom's very uncomfortable when I preach against false prophets or Seventh-day Adventists. So I just don't tell her anymore. Because she thinks, you know, you're not supposed to do that. She gets girls' anxiety. So we have to balance this out. I don't tell her, but let me tell you something. I will rebuke Seventh-day Adventist pastors, and I will rebuke Seventh-day Adventist religion, and I will rebuke false religions because they're leading people to hell. And that's what God's commanded me. Go to Proverbs 28, just a few pages over. It says, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. To have respect of persons is not good. For for a piece of bread that man will transgress. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with a tongue. It's not just enough to say, I don't respect people, because we can learn that lesson and maybe say, look, you know what, I'm just going to stick to my, my house. I'm going to go to my conservative church and listen to the hard preaching, and I'm going to read my Bible. But the Bible here says, he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than him that flattereth with the tongue. Look, if, if, if we're silent about certain things, that's a form of flattery. Now, it's not the most... Uh, Visible form, I mean, flattery in, its, in, in all its, I guess, uh, strength is when you're telling people how great they are. You know, we were, I was showing my wife, I, first of all, this is an oxymoron, but uh, Donald Trump's spiritual advisor is, is a female pastor. I didn't know that. It just popped up on my thing. Her name's Paula White, who speaks in tongues, by the way. I mean, this, this is, she's been divorced twice, and somehow, I mean... There's just so many things wrong with that picture, if you know anything. But one of the things that really stood out to me was they showed clips of her giving Donald Trump rewards and talking about how great of a man he is. You know what that's called? That's a flattering tongue. John the Baptist got his head cut off for telling the king what he shouldn't be doing with his brother's wife, right? Paula... She gets to sit up there with the president and hobnob with everybody because she says, he's so great. He knows how, I don't remember all the exact wording because I, I don't know if that's worth memorizing, but she's like, he, he can foresee the future and he knows the past and he's just got all kinds, he knows all kinds of things. It's scary. These are the people running our country. 
That's why it's so important that we get more independent churches and that they raise a generation that's not going to kowtow to these guys. You know, I'm looking forward to when my kids become teenagers and stand up to somebody. And they come and tell me that they shouldn't do that and be like, no, do it more. Because that's the problem, right? The government tells you that you shouldn't te uh, treat your kids a certain way, so everybody just does it. TV says that this is how we should dress and act and talk, so everybody just does it. The man of God says that these things are sin. Oh, that guy's a terrorist. He's a bad dude. Why? Because we're respecters of people. But God's using us. He's, he, you know, he doesn't want us to just sit on the sideline. This, that's the last point is that if we can overcome this, then we're actually going to go get into action. And we'll, you don't have, like I always say before, you know, you don't have to look for a fight. But every once in a while, especially as a man, it's all right if, if we look for a good spiritual battle. We don't have to, though. But you know what? If it comes to you, we got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared for the things. And one of the things that we, we do have, a, it's a weakness of human nature, is to want to not offend people, is to want to respect other people, other religions, other faiths. You know, Pastor Cobb went and preached at a funeral, and it was surrounded by Mormons. You know what he asked us to preach about? I mean, what he asked us to pray for? The prayer was that God would give him the strength to preach the truth independent of who was there. That's the man of God I want to follow. He's not a respecter of the Mormon religion. Good. I don't, I'm not a respecter of the Mormon religion either. I can't stand Mitt Romney as far as I can throw him, and I can't stand Harry Reid either as far as I can throw him. I'm just going to tell you that, unless they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Peter, and I'll just read James real quick, and we'll close this out. Go to 1 Peter 1. We'll close out with that. But in St. James 2, verse 1, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So let's just stop real quick right there and then we'll read the rest. Is don't have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and respect of persons. Right? It's one or the, have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. For if there come unto you an assembly, a man with a gold ring and godly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Look, it's a sin to have respect for people. And the Bible says that we want to walk in the Spirit so we don't commit sin. And this is, this is a hard saying right here. Look, don't... And by the way, just to clear that up, gay clothing just means happy or... Loud clothing. That's why I try not to say there's gay people, because I'm gay. I'm happy. You know, and it's an old school word. Just remember that that song, Zippity Doo Dah. We'll have a gay old time. It just means you're gonna have a happy time. You know that that's what's what's going on. If we, we have so much respect for people, we won't use things in the right context. Now you got preachers that preach against homosexuality, and they'll say, you know, we're not for gays, when the reality is. The Bible uses the word gay in a positive, con I mean, he's using a negative to describe the negative person, but the positive is that it's just a, a loud thing. It's a happy thing. It's, it's just nice clothing. It's, he's not saying that person is unnatural in their sin. It's a, that's important. We, we need to stand on God's word. The Bible calls them sodomites. The Bible calls them dogs. The Bible says they're brute beasts. Never did he say they were gay. Gay are just happy people. I mean, let's let's make that distinction clear right now. Amen. And go. let's close out with 1 Peter 1, verse 13. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You know, sure it up. Make it strong. It says, Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he... 
which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. He says, look, this road you're traveling, this life you're living, live in fear for the Lord. Not in fear for the world, but live in fear for the Lord. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, whom by him who, who by him, do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Look, I don't respect other versions because some idiot told me that I need to listen to the NIV. I respect God's word because I'm going to preach the gospel. And the only true gospel is from the King James for the English speaking people, uh, speaking people, but also because this is the word of God. And I don't have to have all the science and data and proof. The Bible says it's by faith. Amen. And this is why we have such a strong cause and we want, why we want to go out there and lead the nations to Christ. It's not just enough to get them saved, but let's go out there and, and get more soldiers for Christ. But the only way we do that is we get them to stop respecting people. You say, that sounds like horrible. Don't you teach your children to respect people? Look, there's respect, like common things like, yes, man, yes, sir. And then there's moral respect, like this guy says that, you know, just do whatever you want. I don't respect that at all. I am not a respecter of persons. I fear God and I respect God. And my prayer is that you do too as well. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord.